you all. Thank you all. It's a pleasure to be back. It's a pleasure to be back with you. And it's amazing that we're on this close to the White House. But it's important that we're this close to the White House because we want President Obama to hear us. And we, and we do that in the most respectful of fashions. Now, I am honored to be here with the other speakers. Mrs. Tutu, Reverend Lowry, Colonel Martin, the great commander of our troops at Camp Ashraf and head of intelligence, counterintelligence in, in, in Iraq. And of course, my good friend, Governor Tom Ridge. Tom Ridge is a great patriot. He resigned a great job, Governor of Pennsylvania, to become this nation's first Secretary of Homeland Security. And I am very pleased and honored to have followed Governor Ridge as Governor of Pennsylvania. And I think we can all say not only was he a great Secretary of Homeland Security, but he was probably the second best governor in Pennsylvania's history. <laughs> but Governor Ridge spoke very eloquently, spoke very eloquently about the 4,400 American men and women who died in Iraq. And he said that we have an obligation to them to leave something behind that's worthwhile. And it's true, but Tom didn't have as governor, he later did as secretary, the awesome responsibility of talking to the parents or the wives or the husbands or the children of soldiers who died in Iraq. And I told him, and early on I believe this, I told him, we died trying to give freedom to a people that have been oppressed. And I believe that. But after learning about what the Iraqi government did in 2009, and again in April of this year, the slaughter of innocent people, innocent people who were unarmed, innocent people who were trying their best to live their lives, I'm not sure I could say that to a Pennsylvania soldier's family anymore. And that's a shame because 4,400 of our sons and daughters have been lost. And now we have a chance at least to correct the faults that we've done in the past. And the delisting of the MEK and protecting Ashraf are linked together. Because you know when the Maliki government went in just this past April, they used as an excuse that the MEK was a terrorist organization. Well, Mr. President, it's time to set the record straight. It's time to remove any and all excuses that they might have. It's time to delist the MEK. And Governor Ridge is a Harvard man. I don't know if you know that. And President Obama was a Harvard Law School graduate. I know the president. I worked hard to get him elected. He is a good lawyer. Just look at the facts. Look at the facts, Mr. President. Look at the facts. Look at the fact that the UK and the EU have delisted the MEK. And as Governor Ridge said, a European court even said that the original listing was perverse. Look at the facts of our own Court of Appeals that sits right here in Washington, D.C., a few blocks from where we are. Look at those facts. Not only did they find that the delisting of the FTO is something whose time has come, but they said that the decision by Secretary Condoleezza Rice was not supported by any evidence, that the standard for classifying someone as an FTO was not met in this case. If the D.C. Court of Appeals say that, Mr. President, the United States government should follow the law. But even more than that, even more than that, just a few, just a few weeks ago, just a few weeks ago, a number of us, a number of American public officials signed an open letter to the President that was published in the Washington Post and in the New York Times. There were 12 of us. There were three governors. There were two ambassadors. 
there was one mayor of, the, of New York City, the largest city in the country. There were two congressmen. There were one head of the FBI and one attorney general. And of the 12 of us, we were Democrats, we were Republicans. We worked for President Bush, we worked for President Clinton. It didn't matter. Congress has signed, many members of Congress have signed a resolution asking the President and the State Department to the list. They were Republicans and Democrats. Gosh, in this town you can't get Republicans and Democrats to agree that today is Saturday. President, again, he's a great lawyer. And Mr. President, you've had expert opinions from all of us. Two generals, by the way, signed it, both of whom served in Iraq. You're going to hear from Colonel Martin. And all of them said that in their expert opinion, the MEK was not a terrorist organization. So that's expert opinion, Mr. President, but we have a better piece of evidence. It's called circumstantial evidence. And circumstantial evidence means it's not direct evidence, it's not an eyewitness, but when you hear it, you understand that that means that the case is proved one way or the other. Since the MEK was delisted, not one open source terrorism database, and there are tens and tens of open source terrorism databases that keep track of terrorist incidents all over the world, not one of them has found one incident by the MEK of terrorism. Not one incident of MEK terrorism anywhere in the world against anybody or any country. So if for over a decade there hasn't been any evidence, not one incident of terrorism, what does that mean? It means that the MEK is not a terrorist organization. And as Tom Ridge said, loud and clear, As Tom Ridge said, many Americans were shocked when they learned about the fact that the Iranian government at very high levels was engaged in a plot to kill the Saudi ambassador here in Washington and kill U.S. citizens as well. Were any of you surprised? Of course not, because you know and now everybody knows that there is only one terrorist organization in this play and that is the government of Tehran. Another reason that I supported President Obama so vigorously and so did so many Americans is because he promised that we were going to change the way things are done in Washington. He promised that we were going to have a government, the United States government, that stood for the highest of moral values, that made decisions not on what's politically expedient, but on what is right, on the things that go to the core of the American democracy of the justice and fairness we believe we have in this country, right? And I think, by and large, the President has done that in many, many places. And he has used American power to protect people. When the President said we were going to go into Libya, an airstrike in Libya, the United States, the French, the British, NATO, he was criticized by a lot of his political rivals. But he stood up and said, we are going to act because the United States government, standing for the things that we stand for, couldn't st stood by, stand by silently and let hundreds of thousands of people in Benghazi be put to, to death. We couldn't let genocide happen in Benghazi. We had to protect the citizens of Benghazi from being killed by a tyrant. Now, if that's good enough for Libya, and the president is being praised for what he did, and he deserves praise, he protected innocent people. That's exactly the thing that the United States military might should be used for. Well, if it's okay to protect the citizens of Benghazi from slaughter, shouldn't we protect the citizens of Camp Ashraf from slaughter? Absolutely. And, and Mr. President, Mr. President, we never promised those citizens of Benghazi anything. We didn't promise them anything. We did it because it was the right thing to do. But there's another reason why we've got to protect the residents of Camp Ashraf. Because the United States of America 
the greatest democracy in the world, we promised to protect them. We signed an agreement with each and every one of those 3,400 residents. If they gave up their arms, they would be protected by the American government. And Mr. President, not your fault, but twice the United States has failed to exercise its responsibility. In 2009, during the attack on Camp Ashraf, and again in April of this year. You, you all know, and I don't know if the President's aware, but we put it in our letter that there were United States troops within a mile of Camp Ashraf this April. And an hour and a half before the attack by the Maliki government's army, they were told to withdraw. To this day, we don't know who told them to withdraw. We have no idea. But we do know that it was a shame on the American record. And Mr. President, we gave our word to protect these people. We failed twice. We're not going to fail a third time. Because if we thought... So what do we have to do, Mr. President, in addition to the listing, we have to pressure the United Nations to move speedily. And if the UN won't act, we must. It's our moral obligation. We gave our word. So Mr. President, we're not calling on you to do anything exceptional. We're not calling on you to do anything extraordinary. We're calling on you to do the same thing you did so masterfully in Benghazi and in Libya. We're calling on you to adhere to the values that you've so often spoken of so emotionally and so passionately. And most of all, we're calling on you to make good the promise that the United States government made to these residents. We can do no more, we can do no less. Let's honor our word, let's protect Camp Ashraf, let's delist the MEK, and let's begin the process that we hope someday will lead to a free and democratic Iran.